Insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24. Welcome to the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. You're tuning into an episode of the Redefining Society podcast, hosted by Marco Ciappelli. Let's face it, the future is now. We live in a hybrid analog digital society, and we must stop ignoring it or pretending that technology is not affecting us. The line between the physical and virtual worlds has become a figment of our imagination. On it, we are continually performing a dangerous balancing act juggling convenience, privacy, freedom, security, technology, society, culture, and even the future of humanity. There is no better place than here, and no better time than now to muse on our relationship with technology and how to redefine what society means in this new age. Black Cloak provides concierge cybersecurity protection to corporate executives and high net worth individuals to protect against hacking, reputational loss, financial loss, and the impacts of a corporate data breach. Learn more at blackcloak.io. BugCrowd's award-winning platform combines actionable contextual intelligence with the skill and experience of the world's most elite hackers to help leading organizations identify and fix vulnerabilities, protect customers, and make the digitally connected world a safer place. Learn more at bugcrowd.com. Hello, everybody. This is Marco Ciappelli. Welcome to another episode of Redefining Society podcast. It's a never-ending story. Every time I think I got it down and I redefine it, I have to start all over again just because technology keeps changing. And I don't think it's ever changed this fast, especially in the past few years with uh, the famous or infamous artificial intelligence taking place in everything that we do. And I don't know if we're going to touch on that today, but uh, I have a feeling we may end up talking a little bit about that too. It is a post CES conversation. Um, I didn't make it there this year, and I could have met my guest on uh, on the floor in Las Vegas, but I, like I said, I wasn't there, and I'm excited to have him here. His name is John Tetzner. I hope I pronounce it correctly. He's uh, a, a technologist, the founder of uh, the Opera browser, if I am correct, and now working on the Vivaldi one. So I see a love for music here. Maybe we'll go into that, but <laughs> I'm excited for this conversation. John, thank you for stopping by to the show. Thank you, Marco. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Very good, very good. So do, do we want to start with this Opera, Vivaldi? Is there any motif here, a cla- like a line? I mean, th- there is a tie there, but I mean, it, it kind of started with Opera and, and uh, my co-founder at the time at, at Opera, he uh, he came up with a name and I think we were going for something short and yes, a little bit musical and, and we kind of liked it. Um, there is music in my family. Um, my great grandfather was a composer and my grandmother was a composer, uh, but I can't say that that's where the name is coming from, but but I've kind of kept the names inside the same group. That there's truth to that, yeah. Very cool, very cool. And you choose actually me being Italian and Vivaldi. It's one of my favorite. My too. Uh, yeah, it's uh, I call him the rock star of the Baroque because it's a uh, it's style of doing music. But that's a conversation for another for another day. So. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself, how you got involved in, in technology and, and specifically in developing browsers that, from what I understand, and I actually, believe it or not, I'm using Opera right now as we're recording this for privacy and personalization and what, what motivated to go that way. I mean, um, I started working with the web back in 1992. 
Uh, and this is so early that uh, kind of the web almost didn't exist. So I was working at the research lab for the Norwegian Telecom. I was also doing my studies, actually, as I was doing a master's degree at the time. And we came across the web and we set up uh, kind of the entry point to Norway that would list the other servers that were there. Uh, I worked on uh, a kind of a site which was kind of like an intranet before the term existed. Um, and then we were kind of playing with other things and, and then we decided to make the browser. And they, this is still inside the, the, the telecom. So the research department, part of what we did was looking at, uh, we were looking at interesting technologies. And, and again, we came across the web. We thought this was interesting. We started to make the browser after a lot of discussion. Um, and then there was a discussion what to do with it. And, and uh, we negotiated a deal where we took it out of the telecom company because they had no interest in taking it forward. So we just got the rights and, and we founded uh, Opera. So that's, that's kind of when I, uh, how I started with browsers. And I mean, I started coding the Opera browser in 94 uh, and we founded the company in 95. And back in the days, I, I am dating myself too, but I remember starting to go on the internet. It was the time of Mosaic and Netscape and, uh, and the excitement was, was very, very strong to have a visual graphic interface that you can then uh, surf, the, surf at the time, yeah, <laughs> the, the web, the World Wide Web. And uh, tell, I know it's going to be a long story if I ask you to tell me the story of of the browsers, but I'm more interested maybe into where, where are we standing with the browser? Like, it's is it still the necessary interface to do the things that we do online? I know people a few years ago, they were like, ah, everything is gonna happen in the apps, in the social media, but guess what? Browsers are still here and seems to me they're going strong. What's, uh, what's the status? I think that that's continuing, by the way. And, and the first time I heard that is, is, is with Pointcast. I don't know if that's 97 or something like that, where there was this idea that we didn't need any browsers anymore and we were just going to watch our screens and, and, and see things move. And, 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 and like certain things have happened in that direction. But, but I think a lot of people, they want to be able to control and, and, and select the material that they want to see and, and not just be fed by some algorithm. So I think we, we continue to use the browser and, and, and if anything, I mean, it continues to increase. I mean, it's a very important part of people's lives and people spend a lot of time online and most of that is spent in the browser. What's the, what's the situation? And I just had a conversation before this one and uh, we, we ended up talking about blockchain, about Web 3.0 and nice things about privacy, about, you know, carrying our own uh, records with us, touch on GDPR, touch on um, individual experience and how to protect uh, our individuality and our, you know, who we are right? And not even be impersonated by, especially now with AI. The role of the browser, the browser in, in this, um, it's, is it a kind of shield? It's, it's, it's safe nowadays? It, can it be integrated with blockchain? Where are we standing there? Well, obviously, my take on blockchain and Web3 is that it has nothing to do with the web and it's basically just a scam. Okay, good to know. I like, yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's all related to crypto. And I mean, I mean, crypto is not a solution to any problem. It's a problem in itself. Uh, I've written a blog about it. And, and uh, I mean, a lot of people have reacted positively to that because I think in the industry, a lot of people are thinking the same thing. They're thinking, okay, you shouldn't be able to just go and print your own money and, and things like that. So uh, I think there's generally a consensus that uh, among the people that are in the tech industry that this is not a good thing and we should not be doing this. And, and so that's, that's where I'm coming from. And, and with blockchain as a technology, uh, my feeling has always been it's, it's a technology looking for a problem to solve. But typically most of the solutions that come, uh, they include some kind of crypto. And so it's it's is is another get rich 
uh, kind of quick scheme. And I've had discussions with so many people on this, including friends that wanted to get me involved and, and the like. And uh, it's, I'm saddened that smart people are utilizing their brain power on something like that. Uh, so uh, I don't like it. I don't like the term Web3. Now, Web3 has been talked about for a really long time. But And if you want, don't trust me, ask Tim Berners-Lee what he thinks of Tim, uh, Web3. I think you'll find that his, uh, uh, he's, he's in agreement with me. He's probably more polite in his uh, kind of, in the words that he would use. But there's an agreement that has nothing to do with the web. There are issues with the web, but w nothing that Web3 can resolve, right? Web3 is basically, okay, let's take something people know, let's come with a version three of it and say that uh, kind of, okay, we're coming with something new and, and, and wonderful and you want to use that. And if you don't know what it is, it's because you're stupid, So, which is kind of the, the main argument which comes with, with crypto. So not a fan i mean I, i want to see the web move forward and mm. i've been uh, working with kind of a distributed web but in a different way i mean we started working with that at opera back in 2005 we were thinking about the internet of things and i think that's interesting how you do that in a standardized manner we came up with suggestions on that that we launched in 2010 And uh, so there are things around that, but I, I, I don't really see blockchain or Web3 or anything as being an, any, any part of that. We do have a problem on the internet, and that's the, the idea that you can, all you, any user can be profiled. I, I think that should actually just not be allowed. Uh, and, and we've tried to kind of push that as well. Uh, you can look at our, we, we made a website with the Icelandic Consumer Association um, and you can find it at bandspine.org. There's a cat video trying to explain all of this to you. Um, basically, the, the, the concept of gathering information and how much information is being gathered on us. And I think that's a problem. And, and I mean, as long as you're on the web, it gets to be really hard to avoid being uh, kind of uh, getting into a profile. Now, we try to do things on our side in the browser. We are not collecting information ourselves. I think that's maybe one of the most important things is not to be collecting information ourselves and not building profiles because we think it's wrong to do so. But at, at the same time, we also provide things like tracker blocking and ad blocking in the browser as well. But the first step needs to be there, which is, okay, you're not collecting information yourself. So those are the kind of things that I think is, is important. I mean, for me, I've spent basically whole, my whole working life on the web. I mean, I, I, I came straight out of the school, started working on the browser, more or less straight away. Uh, and... I mean, I've dedicated my life to getting people online, first with Opera and then with Vivaldi. And the idea that, okay, I'm getting everyone online and helping them uh, get a great user experience online, and then they're being profiled. And, and then that information is being used to influence people in, in bad ways. Divide us, make us hate each other, uh, which is part of what's created through the algorithms that are in use at Facebook and the like, but also the advertisement. So those are kind of the kind of things that we are thinking about and 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 again what we are trying to do is to build the best possible browser and and uh, trying to keep people safe but at the same time we have to realize that uh, there are problems on the internet and some of those problems are best solved through regulation good point good point is the never-ending battle between convenience and security right and i want company to know enough about me maybe and i say me in general so that they can suggest me the product that I want, the movie that I am interested in. They know the book that I may read after this book, but at the same time, uh, the privacy. <laughs> It's something that you want. So how do you disclose enough and, and get the benefit of that versus being able to take that back if you need it? Because I think when it's out of the, when it, the, the paste is out of the tube, Uh, you can't put it back in, and, and I'm afraid that's that's where we are. 
Well, I mean, I have a different view of that, actually, because I really think that sometimes, and we've done that before, when we found that we've generated bad technology, we can turn it around. We did it with asbestos, and we can do it with uh, with the collection of information and profiling. I mean, I think, realistically speaking, there's going to be plenty of data uh, out there. Uh, so it's not really a, always a question of taking the data away. It's a question of what you can use it for, right? Right. Right. So if I'm driving around, actually having traffic information uh, is useful, right? So, okay, that's the reasonable use of the data. Right. But it, isn't, it doesn't mean that my personal driving habits uh, and can be then scrutinized for marketing purposes. I don't think there's an automatic tie between those two. So it's a question of, okay, there's reasonable use of the data and there's unreasonable use of the data. And I think we could get rid of all the GDPR kind of dialogue boxes asking you, because I think it should just be a question of reasonable use and unreasonable use. And, and, and I mean, I think in most cases, again, when there's a question of users making the decisions, they don't have the knowledge to make that decision. And I think quite often they are not in... I mean, they, they don't really have a choice. It's kind of like, oh, do you want this shiny thing or do you don't? Even if you want this shiny thing, then you have to give up all your information. And I think that's an unreasonable trade. And I think it's 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 kind of, you can just set the rules of what's reasonable to do. And, and uh, I mean, it, it will change maybe the business model for some some companies, but I think that's a reasonable thing. To me, there's this narrative, there's this story that is being told that the web is built on this, and that's not the truth. The last 10 years, a lot of kind of misuse of data has been there. But before that, you didn't really have personalized ads. You had contextual ads. And I think contextual ads are much more acceptable to the public, it's basically what you're used to from you're watching uh, a tech, you, you go into a tech site, you'll see tech ads, you go into a fashion site, you'll see fashion ads. I think it's a fairly reasonable model that's worked for the longest time. Instead, the ads are following you based on your profile. And I think that's a lot of what people are reacting to. Yep. There's also the privacy things and, and kind of what's reasonable to gather. but. And I think, I mean, that should be part of this is you can, you can collect reasonable amounts of data, you can keep reasonable amounts of data, uh, and, and then you d delete it and, 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 and kind of and there's rules of regulations. In some cases, you as a company will have massive amounts of data on your customers. Maybe you're keeping their email. The idea that someone would scan through your email for marketing purposes, which, I mean, again, Google has been doing with Gmail and the like, is so unreasonable, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't expect your telecommunication company to listen to your calls. You don't expect you, someone painting your house to be making an inventory of your furniture. So why would it be reasonable that anything else that's, that you're doing should be collected? So I, I think, it, I mean, it, it needs to be regulated and I think it, it will have an impact because to me, it's kind of like, okay, if you and me, let's say we are we are technical enough and we turn on, on enough of the, the kind of tracker blocking and things like that to keep ourselves from being tracked as much as the rest of the population, uh, then it's kind of like, to me, it's like in a zombie, being in a zombie movie. We, we are part of the people that are locked into the supermarket and everyone else is outside being a zombie. I think that's a problem. We want to keep everyone safe. We want to help the people that are less technical and, and, and we want to help people. It shouldn't just be that because the data is there that you can take it and use it for whatever. And, and again, the fact that you have the data doesn't give you the right to use it for other purposes. And I think that's, that's something, I mean, I, again, I've been there from the beginning. The idea that you have certain things gives, doesn't give you the right to use it for other things. The fact that you have data on your customers you can't give it to someone else. And prop the problem now is, I mean, you may say you visit a site, there's no real problem in them having information about what you looked at that site, right? As long as it's a small site. 
the problem is when that and every other site that you visit is then used and put into a big profile. That's where it kind of gets ugly. Small information is maybe not so much of an issue. Again, it's a question of how you're using it and how you're doing the profiling. But if the main point is that, okay, you visited a shop and next time you visit that shop, they know that they would like to show you the thing that you were looking at last time, that's probably not a problem. But right. that following you everywhere else that you go on every site that you've been, that just because you looked at a computer or something else that you'll see that computer for the next two weeks everywhere you go. I mean, not only is it ineffective, um, but but I mean, it's it, it's kind of unreasonable, which is why I think so many people are finding that they want to have uh, ad blockers and it's you know, just going I'm, to I'm gonna, While you're describing all of this, I mean, I, I've been thinking about this and, and I think it's all connected to the the model of free, the freemium where Facebook or Gmail, yeah, we're going to give it to you for free, but really it's not free. <laughs> it's not free at all. You're paying for your information, but it's done known in, a, in a non clear way. There is not really an exchange, an agreement, a contract in between to say, okay, you you use these, not really free, you're paying with that. And and I think it started the entire following everywhere, the entire, you know, the, the cookie crumbles that follow you all over the places. So yes, regulation, I think it's important, but also, I don't know, education for the user. I don't think it's reasonable uh, to to. For, it's people have a lot of things to do. They have all the <laughs> things on their mind. They're, they're, most people are not that interested in this, and they don't yeah. want to have to deal with it. They just expect society to work in a reasonable manner. Yeah. I mean, we didn't have to tell the painters that they didn't have to. They they couldn't collect information right. about what we had in our house. I think you're just expecting also that. Okay, your calls that you're having normally, they will not be transcoded. They will not, no one will be listening to your calls. I mean, unless there's a particular reason to. Right, unless uh, police have a serious reason and ask for a permit. Basi that, basically, yeah. I mean, and I mean, I, I think this is, I remember there was a, there was a discussion in Norway. There, there actually, there was an interview or, he was doing a talk, the spy chief in Norway, and, and he was just saying that. He was saying, okay, you're concerned about what we are collecting your data. What you should be collecting is what the big private companies are doing because they're mm -hmm. collecting a lot more than we are. Right. And the point is when the big private companies, when big tech is collecting information and making it available for the highest bidder, I mean, they're not necessarily selling your data per se. They're just selling access to you based on that data. And for that as a society, then they end up becoming a programming machine for us. And I just don't think that's reasonable. And the idea that just because, I mean, again, they've chosen a business model where they're giving things away for free, which has been the mantra for the internet from the very beginning. But I don't think it's reasonable that, okay, they go free to kill the competition. And then they want to basically not uh, provide us with uh, Kind of again. Then the deal is okay. Once you have us, then you can do w with our data whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were, I was at an event and they were talking again about Google Maps and the like. And it used to be mapping services; they would cost money. Then Google Maps came in, and initially the API access was free, and now it's no free anymore. And uh, again, there's they've killed a lot of the competition, which I don't really think is a good thing. I think it's better if you have a working competition. You can have multiple uh, companies that are trying to compete in the mapping service. And the same applies to email and the like. I mean, there are some really good mail companies where you pay a few bucks a year and then you have kind of you're not being tracked and, and they're trying the, their best to, to keep you safe. And I would recommend people to look at those services in, instead of just taking the the, the free ones. But um, on the other hand, some people may not have a choice and they don't have to have the time and uh, to, to think about that. And, 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 and again, I re really then think that there should be rules and regulations that say what you can do and what you can't do. And I don't think there's a way around it. I think the idea that big tech will 
do the right thing is uh, they're not doing that. Uh, they, <laughs> let's we, we, let's we, be we, clear about that. <laughs> we, we, we just seen that they can't be trusted to make the right decisions. And, and, and I think it's really unfortunate because I, had, I personally had expected more from them because I don't think they want to create havoc or, or create problems and the like. But I mean, if you look at the issues with Facebook and their algorithms and the consequences of those, and they're then finding, okay, our algorithm make people hate each other. Maybe we should change them. Oh, we make less money. And I did a little bit of a survey on Mastodon asking people what they thought. Mm -hmm. And I think 90% answered that, okay, if I made a protocol and made people hate each other, I would change it. And they haven't. And, and I think it's, it's kind of, it, it, it's, it's a question of doing the right thing. And, and I think we should expect more from companies that they should be thinking about the consequences of what they're doing. And hopefully then they will make the right decision. Uh, but at the same time, some of them won't. So we need regulation. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and then when I mentioned education, I didn't mean that everybody needs to become their own security guard or knowing exactly how to manipulate and set up their phones, which is impossible. <laughs> you're you're opt-in by default, you're not opt-out, which is another thing that we could talk about. But I, I would like to, to pick your brain on what I feel like I'm, I have to in these days, artificial intelligence. Um, how is it affecting the way that you develop your next generation of the browser is it is it making it certain decision easier or is it complicating thing do you see more of a benefit versus a, a negative i mean here's the point do you know how many users have asked us about ai how many users uh we are, we are a very user-driven company yeah what do you say i would say everybody zero <laughs> the opposite <laughs> yeah i mean it isn't that they're i mean obviously if they want to use ai they can go and they can go to any service that they right. like they, they're not asking for it in the browser right they 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 may be interested i mean people may be interested in playing with it but and there is good use of ai and there's bad use of ai right they, they, there's i, like I think every, we've seen that like everything right it's a tool it's a tool and we've seen massive improvements in, for example, translations and the like. And, and I think that's wonderful. And, and that's the case where we actually are using AI. We are basically used ready-made models to help you with translations, right? So, so we built in a translation feature and we, we're continuing to improve that. And we're doing that with a third party, but the servers are hosted by us. And, 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 and again, we are not using the data in any way. We just build the models and then we use them. Right. So it, it, it's, I think it's a good use of data of AI. Uh, it's a good use of AI. And I think there are other ways to do AI in a good way. And then there's bad ways. I mean, part of what we've been seeing recently is the, the significant improvement in spam. It's a lot better written. It's written in localized language. It's, it's a lot more uh, to the point. And I think a lot of that is, is, is coming from them utilizing new tools that are available to them. And that's really unfortunate. Um, I think the companies that are competing on AI, companies like Google and Microsoft and the like, they've proven themselves to not be trustworthy when it comes to making decisions when they're when their companies, when they feel that their companies are at risk and the like, right? So they are feeling that this is a game changer in the industry. And I think in a way they're making decisions which can be unfortunate. I am following also, uh, how is it going with, uh, with the results? If you're asking questions and if you are asking the AI machine that is uh, now supposed to be answering the one question with a singular answer, will it give the right answer? And the problem is it won't. Uh, it will make something up and it may sound right, uh, but that's part of the problem. And then it will probably be manipulated. I mean, try asking about why is Microsoft called the evil empire and see if you get an accurate answer to that or tell me about kind of embrace, extend, extinguish. Uh, and you can see that it's kind of, it will tell you 
Microsoft used to be called this or they did those things, but now they have a new CEO who is yeah. walking on water. And <laughs> and I mean, I'm I'm pretty certain that that wouldn't come up automatically. So it's 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 kind of like there's question marks on this, and and there isn't always. If you're asking plus what two plus two is, I mean, obviously there's a simple answer, and you should be able to give that answer correctly. When the answers are more complex, it gets to be more difficult. And will the answers then be? I mean, all the issues that you have with whatever is written about you is that kind of or written about anyone else? It's is that going to be the truth? Is that going to be correct? It's it's complicated and 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 i think it's exciting on the one side it's interesting technology but it's also the next step in big data and big data so far has been used for a lot of really bad stuff and and more collection of data is is not what we are needing uh, and in particular indiscriminate use of that data yeah yeah for sure no i i, I was more interested in and you kind of mentioned that in the translation like in, in creating uh the internet more accessible because it may help for people that are impaired to, for visually impaired and so you can read things much more effectively than what you know language model or translation model could have done five years yeah. ago ten years ago so i i can definitely see that but um it's an open open territory and i i agree as especially as a european to give much more relevance to privacy and i agree that it's legislation i need to step in because when you make the money and all your decisions are based on how much more money you can make every quarter it's uh it's hard to find humanity and and ethics in those kind of driven forces so you, you need to have an objective that yeah yeah you need the regulation and i think i mean also in the us that's what people want as well it's just i think a, a lot more people here have given up on the idea that okay that there will be regulation that regulation will work that uh they're kind of that again the train has gone and, and there is nothing you can do about it and uh, and if you were to change that it would have massive impact on these companies but what i've tried to say is that in the chains, when there are certain companies that just said, okay, I'll use whatever data I get for whatever I want because it's all mine, mine, mine. Uh, they they made those choices and through that, they were winners and losers, right? right? If you look at the consequences where we were 10 years ago with regards to, uh, again, there was most of the press in content on the internet was free at the time there was very little that had gone behind paywalls and i think the point of that is that the revenue model were actually working at that time it's very logical if you take uh and i mean you wanted to reach someone a technical user you would want to reach them on a technical site now you can reach them anywhere you just have to, as long as he visited that technical site you can find them anywhere and it's expanding the scope. I mean, in the early days of the internet, you would say, okay, you, you are talking about a high quality placement. You might be paying a $50 CPM, right? $50 per thousand views of an ad. Now, if uh, the ad was being shown kind of in some of these uh, kind of uh, ad uh, kind of systems that were just showing ads wherever there was space, then you would be getting 50 cents, so 100 to 1 mm -hmm. in, in cost, because you wanted your ads to be shown in, in, in quality locations. Now that's changed, and you have an algorithm deciding what's shown what, where and what. And, and so the, the change in the model is significant. And yeah, it's... Yeah. Yep. No, no, I, I agree with you. I, I, I grew up with advertising when advertising wasn't the internet. And all this value on the on the click and on the tracking, it, it for me is all making sense the old school. Like if you have a an editorials on cars, that's where Mercedes and BMW and the good cars should put their advertisement. Because not only is where people are interested, but is when people are interested. Because I may be a car fan, but if I'm looking at a website that is about, I don't know, travel, 
maybe I don't want to see the ad for the car. <laughs> maybe you're yeah. invading and, and disturbing me in a moment that I'm not receptive to that kind of ad. So that makes sense to me. And I think, again, maybe we've been carried away a little too much by the possibilities of the technology. And just because we can do it, it doesn't mean that we have to do it. And it doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. So, well, a lot of thinking here from what you said, and I, I love how you've been completely open and straightforward on, on your opinion. Um, I'm a big fan of, uh, of uh, privacy and a big fan of what you guys are doing. And I think that what you say, just pay a little bit if you can for a service that is actually going to take care of you, then get something for free and then you end up paying way much more than that. So. Well, uh, John, thank you for stopping by. It's been an honor to have this conversation with you. I hope uh, you can join me back uh, some other times in the future and good luck with everything you've done. And hopefully I'll get to meet you in person on the next uh, event somewhere around the world. Thank you. Anytime. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. All right. Thank you, John. And for everybody else, stay tuned. Uh, there'll be a way to see what John does in the notes and connect with him and uh, the browsers that he's been working on. And uh, if you have any comment, let us know and we'll try to get back to you. Talk to you soon on the next conversation. Take care. BugCrowd's award-winning platform combines actionable contextual intelligence with the skill and experience of the world's most elite hackers to help leading organizations identify and fix vulnerabilities, protect customers, and make the digitally connected world a safer place. Learn more at bugcrowd.com. Black Cloak provides concierge cybersecurity protection to corporate executives and high net worth individuals to protect against hacking, reputational loss, financial loss, and the impacts of a corporate data breach. Learn more at blackcloak.io We hope you enjoyed this episode of Redefining Society podcast hosted by Marco Cipelli. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think then add this show to your favorite podcast player, subscribe to our YouTube channel and share the ITSP Magazine podcast network with your friends, family and colleagues. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. Insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24.